Hello and welcome to the Grain Talk webinar hosted by Grain Farmers of Ontario. This edition of our webinar is to discuss pests to watch out for in the coming weeks, as well as disease in the 2023 grow as as the 2023 growing season progresses. I'm Laura Ferrier, agronomist with Grain Farmers of Ontario, and joining me today, also from Grain Farmers of Ontario, is Marty Vermey, senior agronomist. We have two special guests with us today: Tracy Bouty and Albert Tanuda. Tracy Bowdy is a field crop entomologist with OMAFRA based out of Ridgetown. Her areas of focus include collaboration on applied research and demonstration projects to validate and determine practical integrated insect management solutions, to monitor for and implement strategies for new invasive species and develop management strategies. Tracy is also the chair of the Canadian Corn Pest Coalition. And for those that aren't familiar with the Corn Pest Coalition, it is a collaborative group of corn experts promoting the proper stewardship of corn pest management technologies. Thanks so much, Tracy, for joining us, and we're excited to hear what you have to share with us today. Thanks for having me. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'd like to talk about um, essentially four different issues, so hopefully we'll get through it in time, um, that I, I foresee being a problem for 2023. So the first one is dimethoate resistant um, to spotted spider mite. So dimethoate being Saigon and Lagon um, has been the only product that uh, we've had registered for uh, use on soybeans um, and for some years dry beans, though there is a new product for dry beans as well. But essentially it was the go-to product or active and we have now confirmed that we have resistance and we're working with uh, University of, of Western as well as Ag Canada to determine the extent of that resistance and also test different potential other miticides that could get registered um, in the near future. So in terms of the actual uh, locations, we've collected over the last two years, uh, 31 sites, um, mainly so Southern Ontario. Um, and this map just shows those 31 locations. Green dots mean that dimethoate still worked on them from the collections that we took from the fields. Um, but the red or pink or, or um, peach colors indicate the level of tolerance or lack of mortality, essentially, um, from some of those. So a lot of uh, dry bean regions, as well as some in, in the further southwest um, that are starting to show up um, with resistance. And in fact, and I know this is a small and complicated heat map, but I'm going to explain it um, a little more clearly. So from the 31 soybean locations that we took, uh, the pink ones being from last year, 2022, and the green ones being from 2021, they were tested against dimethoate, as well as uh, another six different actives that I mentioned could be registered. Um, this one uh, is registered, uh, spir I never say it right, spiromethacin, there we go, spiromethacin, or Oberon is registered on dry beans, um, but we could get it on soybeans. Though again, all of these actives are used currently on pork crops, so they tend to be more expensive. Um, that said too, these mites, they are pests of everything almost. They're likely to be getting exposed to some of these. So out of, as I mentioned, the 31 soybean uh, locations, 18 of them show tolerance. So these red and pink are um, showing that they can't be killed by dimethoate anymore. But unfortunately, even Oberon, um, which uh, shouldn't be used much yet in soybeans, it's not registered, but it is showing up in some of our locations, especially Wardsville and West Elgin. And then also another um, very commonly used active, um, Evamectin, on hort crops in the Niagara area, our, our sites there have shown tolerance to that um, active already. But the positive thing is that um, most of the populations are susceptible. All the green indicates populations that were killed by these. So there is some promising um, actives that we could look at. Granted, again, they may not be as cost effective. Uh, certainly dimethoate has been a pretty cheap um, option for quite a while. Um, but won't be an option going forward. We are interested though in still taking samples for this year. So look for symptoms like stippling on leaves. Looks like the plants are getting sandblasted. Um, you may see actual 
what looks like almost drought or even cis nematode um, locations in the field um, that, that um, yellowing or drying down. And so take a good look on the underside of the leaf. You'll see tiny little dots moving and, and webbing. And with a hand lens, you can actually see the, the mites crawling around. Um, it doesn't take much for them to uh, reach threshold though. So we're willing to take infestations or samples um, even before a spray has to be done. Um, but of course, report those to me. They usually do move into soybeans right after wheat harvest because they're hanging out there, not doing much, but um, wheat harvest, they tend to get um, blown into the soybean and dry bean fields. Watch again, scout after windy days because wind will carry them as well. Of course, spray, if you um, do reach threshold, uh, threshold is four mites per leaflet or you know a few um, very infested plants. And if you do apply dimethoate and it does not work, then report that too to me because we'd like to come and take samples and take them into Western to get um, tested out. Next is- Tracy? Um, yes. Just regarding uh, the spider mites, I mean, it's been a fairly wet season, so probably a lot been washed away. So we're hopeful for that. Hopeful there for could that. turn, it and there's pockets turn. of the province that might be dry, because I think further east there is some yes. dry pockets. How late in the season could they still infect? So if we got rain now, if it dries up in August, is there yep. still that risk? Absolutely. Yeah, you were looking till about our four, our five, um, and even our earlier our six, but really most of the yield uh, loss could happen by about R4. Um, so, so any fields that are, are still in those, especially obviously later planted fields that are gonna take a little bit more time. Um, so yeah, August could change completely and be dry again and cause us a problem, but fingers crossed, um, we don't see them. Though even in 2021 was a wetter year and about 10 sites showed up with them. So just, you know, be aware if you have a prone field to spider mites, um, keep, keep track, even on those wet days, wet years. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So my next concern, unfortunately, the rest, another resistant issue. Um, some of you may have heard and, and some may have attended Dinosaur Days, but um, back in 2018, as you recall, Jocelyn Smith went to Nova Scotia and found damaged fields in cry 1F corn um, and quite extensive, but 70% of the plants had um, damage. So she tested those populations to are susceptible. So um, this is more dose, higher doses of cry over, um, over, over the graph on the um, X axis. The Y axis is mortality. So our susceptible population in Ontario died quite quickly on a pretty low dose, 100% um, mortality, where hardly, well, none of the populations that were um, collected in Nova Scotia died. And in fact, they couldn't kill them even in the highest dose that they could test on these, these populations. We increased monitoring for this pest um, and, and looking for unexpected damage in fields across Canada um, because of this. And so that initial um, area in Truro um, Nova Scotia has Cry1F resistance, but also collections made in New Brunswick were found to be resistant. Populations close to Montreal have been found to be resistant to Cry1F, and a population in Manitoba, um, just south uh, west of um, Winnipeg, uh, was found to have Cry1F resistant population. On top of that, unfortunately, in 20 Last, last fall, 2022, they went back to check that Truro a location um, that was first found to have Cry1F, and they found um, resistance in Cry1AB, Cry1F hybrid. So they took those populations back and tested them. They are indeed resistant to Cry1AB, but even more concerning, they're also resistant to another Cry, Cry1A.105. So just as a reminder, we only have four functional proteins that work on corn, uh, corn borer. Um, the VIP doesn't have any activity whatsoever. So that leaves Cry1AB, Cry1F, and then the paired Cry1A.105 and Cry2AB2. Unfortunately now, with at least the population in Truru, 
uh, we have resistance to all three of the CRI ones that are effective. So really we are leaving just one CRI, um, CRI 2A um, to work, which is very concerning because that's gonna just lead to, to rapid resistance. We do have to do some more monitoring though. Um, so look at the, your trait uh, table list. You'll see almost all of the hybrids that we um, use, even just corn rootworm hybrids tend to be paired with at least one or two um, corn borer. So just assume essentially that any of your BT has uh, corn borer uh, protein and go scout for them. We've been very lucky since the introduction of BT we significantly suppressed corn borer to almost extinction, but it's clearly adapted. Um, why I'm concerned about this resistance is that um, corn borer is, it has many hosts, several uh, that are important commodities for us, um, including dry beans and snap beans and apples, um, and, but even um, some of the merging crops like cannabis and millet and, and quinoa and a major pest for um, crops like potatoes and peppers, and especially even greenhouse peppers. Um, so, you know, we're, we're now going to potentially see the increase in those um, commodities too with corn borer because of this resistance developing. What I'm also concerned about is uh, this, um, those same cry proteins are used in the foliar VT products. So now with this resistance happening here in Canada, um, we're gonna likely also have an impact on all of the organic production that really heavily rely on um, the BT foliar products, uh, Dipel, uh, Thuricide, and, and all the others um, that contain BT. So, you know, this is concerning and, and requires us to really be monitoring for it. And even though we don't expect it to be here in Ontario, at least southwestern Ontario immediately, um, we, we do need to report quickly and, and be able to respond. So here are some of the things to look for when you're going to scout for your um, corn borer. So obviously some of the stages, if you happen to be trapping, you might see the moths, but really you're more likely to, to come across potentially egg masses, so they're pretty tiny on the plant. They look like um, layered fish scales um, and white when they're first uh, laid, but then when they're about to hatch, they start to look like little dots, uh, black dots, because the heads of the um, larva. And then you, you may even see the tiny larva hatching. There's five stages of larva. Um, the, the biggest um, is what you tend to see actually down in the stock um, later in the season, but um, they're pretty indescript other than a, a bit of um, uh, they have dots on them and a dark head um, unlike western mean cutworm and all of the big heavier chunkier um, larva that you may see european corn borer is kind of the slim one um, and, and just has these dots as a as a defining um, a descriptive uh, characteristic um, some of the injury that you might see. If you go in now, um, an early whirl to early tassel, um, you might see some um, window painting because the tiny larva can't really chew right through the leaf yet. Um, so they scrape the leaf, very kind of similar to cereal leaf beetle. Um, but when they actually do finally get a little bigger, they can mine into the whirl and cause this shot hole when the whirl unfurls. So you see that uh, distinct line. Or if you even un unfurl the whirl and look at the tassel, you might find tiny larva feeding there. They, when they're just a bit bigger, they can finally mine into the midrib of the leaf and then head their way down into the stalk. Later in the season, you might see um, actual stalk boring. So they may come to the leaf axles to feed a little bit on the pollen, and then they mine at the leaf axle and, and you'll see their frass. So um, it looks kind of like sawdust. They push out their poop um, to keep the um, stock um, tunnels a little bit cleaner. Um, so you'll see uh, at these leaf axles that, that frass. Or you may even actually see um, the actual stock break, though I'm finding modern um, hybrids are pretty um, tolerant to some of that feeding. So they may actually not even look like they're harmed um, until later in the season if they actually start to develop stock rots um, and even ear rots. 
but a good uh, telltale sign. And this is what indicated to Jocelyn and, and Jasmine and others that went into Nova Scotia is broken tassels. If you see broken tassels, um, there's very few uh, pests that actually mine into the tassel. Um, so a broken tassel is a really good sign that it's got corn, corn borer injury. And if it turns out to be a good um, ear rot year or um, fusarium year, they are very known to, to um, bring in that um, fusarium because of the damage that they're doing in the stalks and, and also on the ear. So fingers crossed, it's not a good uh, ear mold year, but um, this is my concern. And I would say, you know, we suspect that potentially Eastern Ontario would be um, one of the first areas in Ontario to experience um, potential resistance because of being so close to Montreal and, and that known site. So really want any growers, but um, even more focus on um, the Eastern Ontario area to, to watch for. So if you do find, you know, 5% or more of your plants that are supposed to be BT have any kind of corn borer feeding, contact your seed provider and me, um, because as soon as we can get into those fields and take some collections and do some tests to make sure that it's BT, um, we can determine if it's resistant and then um, potentially um, implement some mitigation measures to, to try and keep it from spreading over time. Because unfortunately, the sightings that we saw in Nova Scotia were probably a good few years of feeding before it was noticed because too many plants were um, injured to just be a one year scenario. Tracy, yes. are we yeah. at more risk of insect movement with European corn borer or is it more the development of resistance uh, because of the trait technology? A little bit of both. The moths are very mobile. The larvae are not, but the moths are. So they can fly out of their field and they have that tendency to do so um, from the fields that they, started with they'll they'll leave and go to another field um, but also the fact that we've lined up three out of the four cry proteins against them are all cry ones and they're of the same mode of action so once they develop resistance to one they can easily be become resistant to the others so just a few more things i wanted to point out it's time to start monitoring for corn rootworm um, thankfully from the funding from grain farmers of ontario and Abstech, we have traps to give out. And it was very helpful um, last year to identify fields that, have, uh, that are concerned, concerning, they have resistance. Anything that had um, two or more beetles per trap per day, which are the bigger circles and especially the red, um, indicate um, signs of resistance. So we probably have resistance um, happening anywhere from Chatham, Kent, um, potentially even in Eastern Ontario, though not many sites have been set up there to know but it's something to monitor for and, and keep an eye out for um i'm going to skip that because i talk so our high risk counties are anywhere from chatham kent all the way up to durham but even prescott and russell starting to show um, one field that's concern and so if anyone wants to join the network we're focusing on continuous corn because of course that's the highest risk um, scenario uh, where the larvae are after about three years of corn, there's enough larva feeding on the roots and there's been enough adult activity laying eggs um, to really cause an issue. And so corn on corn just keeps giving them um, the corn that the larvae need to survive on. Um, but uh, we just set up four traps along the field, uh, one row and monitor every week um, from now until the end of, of uh, August, early September to know. And, um, this is a good way of seeing some of that suspicious um, injury and um, just see the prevalence of the adults to really flag problem fields. Um, there's also a demonstration video if you go to Iowa State University, you click, click in Iowa State Rootworm, um, you'll actually get to their site that contains our network as well and a demo video to show you how to put your sites on the, um, into the system. And I have one final, oh, and, and of course my request is, um, if you're seeing any rootworm resistance, um, please uh, let me know um, right quickly, because again, we will take collections and um, test for them as well. 
So with that, I'm hoping that some of these things aren't an actual issue, but unfortunately I do feel resistances are in our future and, and we do need to um, be monitoring for them. So uh, please notify me if you do see any of this happening. That's great. Thanks so much, Tracy, for sharing the, the I guess, not top three, because there's still a lot of other things that can be seen in the field, but some things to be on the lookout for for the 2023 season. And uh, yeah, lots of resources there for, for farmers to, to learn more and to get in touch with you if they have any questions, of course. Thanks so much. Thank you. One question I have for you, Tracy, just wondering about uh, soybean aphids. I've been hearing a few people <laughs> talking about it. Just yes. wondering if you have any comments on soybean aphids. Yep, if I had time, I was gonna talk about that. <laughs> but um, yeah, there are some fields that are showing up with aphids not all of them are reaching threshold but it is getting time so any fields in r1 and beyond should be scouted weekly um, we are seeing some beneficials coming into play uh, but of course uh, follow the threshold you know 250 um, per plant and 80 percent of the plants but watch it, it really the injury level is 650 so that buffer of um, time and, and aphids uh, helps the beneficials keep up and gives you some time to, to determine if they are keeping up. So the aphid advisor app is still available. It's both on Google Play and the Apple Store um, to use for free um, to help you make those decisions. And I'm hoping again, after wheat harvest, ladybugs really move in and um, can, can have a big impact on the aphid population. So fingers crossed that the majority um, aren't a problem. We're getting timely rains at least heat hot days really slow down the aphid reproduction and so um i'm i'm really hoping that that's um, gonna not be a risk one thing i need to flag is matador can't be used this year on them um, we we can't use them in field crops but safino is um, a really good alternative is registered and um, a little less hot on the beneficials so it actually is uh, a, probably a better product to use for this year any consideration on threshold? Because we've got a lot of short beans. They seem to take forever to grow. They took a month to come out of the ground. They really yep. seem behind. Any considerations on plant height? Yep, I would I would suggest if the beans are already additionally stressed from uh, lack of rain, et cetera, um, that threshold gets lowered a bit. You know, maybe don't push it past 500 aphids per plant. Um, but these timely rains certainly have helped um, so that they should start to, to put out more leaves than than aphids can keep up with so I, i'm hoping that's going to improve the situation thanks great we'll now trans transition over to albert albert is the field crop extension plant pathologist with omafra based in ridgetown his areas of focus with with omafra include pathology for field crops including emerging issues control strategies and new technologies in pathology and collaborating on applied research and demonstration projects to validate and determine practical disease management solutions. And he also helps with a number of publications and other organizations, such as the Crop Protection Network. Thanks so much for joining us today, Albert. Thanks, Laura. I appreciate the opportunity. So today I'm going to touch on a very similar what Tracy did in terms of some of the hot topics and some of the diseases that we are seeing right now and some of the phone calls and inquiries we've been getting uh, lately as well. One of the um, first ones is uh, right now, as we're seeing wheat, uh, it's just starting to come off early stages of wheat harvest in Essex. We're starting to hear of um, some issues around black point and uh, and uh, in this particular case, we're, you know, as the name implies, you're starting to see on the kernel at the at the germ end, uh, there's a black discoloration, a smudging of sorts on those kernels. It's um, often, before you even see that, the most common um, concern or, or you know issue around that is you start seeing this black cloud of spores uh, around the combine. And that's very typical of what we would see with black point or other um, sooty molds or other um, saprophytic fungi that uh, either the, the straw or the uh, infect the straw or the heads of the wheat as well. And so this is basically all, alternary and some other pathogens can be uh, um, the reason for this black point. The wet, warm conditions we've had during grain fill and ripening soft dough uh, stage has really 
promoted um, this group of fungi and hence the black point. The good news is there's no mycotoxins associated. Um, as far as I know of right now, I don't believe there's been any downgrading, but that is something that could be a possibility. So for growers out there, as, as we start moving uh, weed harvest across the province, get out there and scout your fields. Um, take, take some kernels, um, look at the um, heads, look at the kernels and see if you've got some black point in there. Um, recommend it to harvest those those first. But again, as we said, there's no mycotoxins associated with it, but something to be aware of, something that's occurring right now. The other thing that we're seeing in soybeans, again, as a result of the environment, particularly in the Southwest here, where we've been getting these, um, we had that dry cycle. Now we're into this wet cycle of anywhere from three to seven to 10 inches of rain over the past uh, two weeks or so, we're starting to see some soybeans that are, are showing our classic wilting symptoms. And as you can see in these three images here, um, uh, the, the, the top one over uh, on this side here is basically a, a uh, soybean wheat rotation. Uh, this is from the long-term rotation plots that Dr. Dave Hooker at Ridgetown um, has, and these have been going on for about 20 to 30 years right now. And you can see having quite a few soybeans in the rotation, we're definitely seeing that, that impact. Same thing on the left here in the continuous soybean uh, uh, plot here. We're also seeing much more of this typical root rot type symptoms that are occurring here. You can see the crop rotation is beneficial when it comes to managing many of these, you know, these root rot and wilting type symptoms. Uh, the bottom here, this is a three crop rotation. This is our corn, soybean, wheat rotation. Um, in for growers out there that uh, are seeing these symptoms, more than likely we're looking at phytophthora and fusarium in these. Um, it the most common um, phone call or um, concern here is that uh, um, after these rain events, shortly after that, two or three days, you start seeing this collapsing or wilting of these, these plants. Very typical of that. That would indicate that there's a, a root. Um, the roots are, are compromised, not able to utilize that moisture. Moisture is not an issue. There's adequate levels there. It's just that the plants are not able to, to utilize that and, and develop, hence uh, the wilting symptoms here. So if you see these, get out there, dig up those plants and look at those root systems. Now, it will also show more so in the later on during the day as the plants require needs for, for moisture or water um, increases, particularly under hot conditions or high temperatures, uh, then early in the morning, uh, you may see the symptoms not being as, as pronounced as, as, the, as the day goes on. Albert, with these rotational trials, are you finding it's more of the population of the spores that are in the soil because of the rotation or is it the soil health or like the, the soil porosity because of the rotations the soil is better to drain like I, I don't know if any water was laying on here or maybe it was the length of time how wet it was yeah so in this in these trials here actually that whole farm has been uh, just got tiled about uh, two three years ago so um, we're moving water a lot better than we used to in this particular case, this is a Brooks and Clay uh, soil. It's about 32% clay. Um, so it's on the, the lighter side of uh, the clay spectrum or the Brooks and Clays. It's, um, it's not like what we would see in Niagara, Lambton, or Essex County. And so soil type plays a big factor in these, particularly when we're looking at the phytophthora as well as, as the fusarium in there too, in that um, anything that uh, saturated those soils, um, leave those conditions, um, um, wet for a longer period of time can promote uh, um, this, these these wilting symptoms occurring there. There's also, um, you know, anaerobic conditions can also cause some wilting um, as well because in those anaerobic conditions, even though uh, the roots are so saturated, they're not able to get their oxygen there or so, and there also can show these very similar symptoms. Those are under those extreme saturated soil conditions that we see for two, three days or or more. We did have wet conditions here, but nothing really ponded so so much here. What we're seeing is the where we see more and more of the soybean in this rotation, very similar conditions as we see in those Essex, Lambton, and Niagara soils, we start seeing more and more of these type of symptoms. And, and a lot of that is just the just the, um, the the clay soils tend to stay wetter, longer, which help promote these uh, pathogens, particularly the phytophthora, because those are those oomycetes. And there they, they produce uh, 
mobile um, zoospores that actually swim in that water film, Marty. And, and that's what drives us and, and, and moves it into uh, the ability to infect these these um, the soil and structure. Roots. Soil yeah. structure has a huge impact in rotations. Oh, right. oh yeah, you're going to see this on the clays, and uh, we're seeing it mostly on on the on the clays uh, for sure, on this side. And then on the corn side, uh, we've been getting a lot of calls around the lower leaves of soybean, uh, lots, lower leaves of corn, having a, a brown discoloration, yellowing uh, of the leaves, particularly on the first, second, or, or third leaf on the bottom. And that's very typical of what we would see this year. Anthracnose leaf blight is always the first uh, foliar leaf disease that we see in corn. This is your typical anthracnose leaf symptoms where you get that tan uh, lesion or, or area with a dark border around it. They can be individual or they can start to join up and get larger. And if you look in, in the center, you'll see these acerviuli or um, the fruiting bodies of the anthracnose pathogen here. And you can see the CT. If you look closely, you'll see these little hairs there. Very typical of anthracnose leaf flight. Very different than our anthracnose stock rot. Just because you have leaf flight doesn't necessarily mean you'll have stock rot later on in the season. But again, it's one that um, at this early stage, although a lot of concern and questions about it, it's not one that I get too worried about right now because those little leaves are going to disappear as well. So something that we're seeing out there and that um, Tracy would be pleased to know that this has probably been the most common um, symptom or images and videos that I've had sent to me. Um, now this is a little later, um, but this is basically, um, you know, insect frass, aphids, other things you know, later on in the season, you see all kinds of things on, on the leaves. Everybody's looking for tar spot, of course. Right. And so, uh, right now, and, and, and I, strongly encourage you to um, rub and rub and wet and rub again, because uh, as of right now, we have not detected or confirmed tar spot in, in Ontario. Everything I've seen and brought to me and that so far um, has turned out to be basically insect feeding or um, some frass on there as well. So again, um, it's, I'm not, you know, we're going to see tar spot uh, pretty soon. Um, this is what you typically see with those tar spot lesions. These do not rub off. Um, they start, you know, you can have the, the stroma or the, the tar spot lesions that are raised. You can also have them taken on this long longitudinal shape or diamond shape to them as well. Later on in the season, you can see the fish eye, but this will be where we're at. Um, and I would expect that we're going to see this uh, over the next week or two. Um, the environmental conditions, I'll talk about that, have been ideal for it. So as you're planning, as you're out there scouting right now and planning for uh, this upcoming season and concern around the tar spot, you know, some of the risk factors and management um, questions that we have is, you know, history of the disease in the region. Um, you know, no-till, corn on corn, um, wet um, you know, wet conditions, high humidity, um, all of those uh, kinds of um, conditions or factors um, increase the risk of, of tar spot. Um, and what we've seen over the years um, from 2020, when we first found tar spot in Ontario, to, to 2021, which is in the gray here, where we saw basically anywhere from Toronto over into uh, as far east as, as Simcoe County. And then last year, which was a very favorable wet season, um, similar to what we're seeing right now uh, for 2021. And then 2022, which was had an extended dry period up to late July, um, just as corn pollinated, we saw um, less tar spot um, and, the, and the geographical footprint of it uh, reduced as well to the southern uh, part of, of the province uh, as well. And so um, one thing to keep in mind is so Southwest Ontario uh, is, is, the, is the traditional area for, for traditional, meaning two years worth of uh, data that we have for tar spot in Ontario. Where are we right now? Um, Indiana came up on uh, board on, on Friday, Saturday, but mostly we're looking into uh, Iowa, Missouri, um, and, and Kansas right now where confirmed uh, tar spot uh, confirmations are. I, I expect we will start seeing Michigan coming on board more into Indiana, not so much Wisconsin just yet because they've been dry, um, but I suspect in our case, um, we will be seeing um, you know, tar spot uh, 
and I'm going to, right after I'm done this, I'm going to be out scouting it um, as quickly as possible. Didn't get out on the weekend um, and, and, and that, but that early first to second week of July is when we see tar spot in Ontario the past two years. So I expect it'll be um, on, on board to, to keep in line with that time frame based on what we're seeing right now with these environmental conditions, particularly the cooler temperatures we've been having, we've been, you know, and, and that, um, this leaf wetness is, is is one of the keys here, and we see uh, dew starting off pretty early and lasting for these uh, seven hours or, or longer at night. We've been having the frequent rain showers. All of these, uh, with the relative humidity, um, are probably very favorable. You know, the rain uh, we've already surpassed this monthly rain and uh, total uh, for much of this area as well. Um, so you know. I suspect that we will probably see tar spot in the next uh, um, few, you know, week or so as well. So it'll be on 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 time. But again, we've we've seen that in 21. We've seen that in 22. The key for tar spot will be what the weather conditions will be as we move into late July um, into August. Will it be favorable or won't be favorable? And that will drive where we're at. And I suspect with 2022, uh, 2023, it'll be somewhere in between uh, 2021 and 2022. The other question around this whole thing is, do we spray or do we not spray? And again, when it comes to making those uh, spray decisions, couple of things to keep in mind where to target uh, yeah, put your resources there target your high risk fields first um, so you know again as I mentioned with tar spot knowing a history of the disease have you had it is it present in the area um, are you in a condition a field conditions that are more favorable that corn on corn heavy residues all of those that could promote that in-field development of, of tar spot. Tar spot does move uh, um, aerial too and will come into those fields. But again, that will be a later infection. The earlier, uh, higher risk ones would be those where um, the disease develops within the field on the lower leaves. Right now, I would be scouting your third to sixth leaf um, there, that's where it's tar spot would be uh, right now. And those are the where I'd be doing, uh, looking at that in terms of spraying, again, your high yield fields, susceptible hybrids. Um, and of course, the, the not only the weather conditions we have now, but what the favorable, or is there going to be favorable weather conditions forecast um, down the road as well. When it comes to the data, and, and I won't go through all of it uh, for us in terms of what we've seen in our results over the past uh, couple of years, thanks to, uh, partly thank you to the GFO and, and their support here, is that, you know, we know environment is a strong driver for tar spot, as I mentioned with uh, the various leaf wetness, humidity, et cetera. Start understanding your farm risk. We can't manage the weather, but we can manage or reduce our infield or field to field risk as well. So again, as I said, and I keep hitting on this, know what's going on for tar spot, the field history, but also keep track of any alerts in that. Uh, you know, we, we've got a real time network as you saw with those maps. So we can, uh, if anything, tar spot, we know where it is and uh, in real time and, and, and just be aware of that. Um, have an idea in terms of your hybrids as well, as I said, is it a susceptible or tolerant? Other diseases as well, the northern corn leaf blights, gray leaf spots, all of those are, are important again. And also the, those, those high yield uh, potentials. In our results, we saw that all our fungicides that we utilized, um, you know, we tested up to 16 different fungicides, were able to reduce tar spot um, incidence and impact uh, compared to the non-treated controls. But there are a few that are, are much more uh, consistent in their response to tar spot. And primarily what we're seeing are those fungicides with two or three way modes of action have been the most consistent. They've reduced uh, both tar spot levels as well as uh, provided increase in, in yields. One thing in terms of the timing side of it, again, the most consistent there has continued to be that RT, RVT to R1, so that tassel to silking stage continues to be um, the most uh, consistent fungicide application timing there. We do have some tools, as I mentioned, the maps. Uh, there is Tar Spotter app out there as well um, to, to help, um, 
help your scouting efforts and 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 potentially help in terms of uh, spray um, application timings as well. And but remember, coverage is critically important when it comes to to getting the most out of these fungicides. If you don't uh, get it where it needs to be, you could use the best product, get it on the right time, but you're not going to be happy with the results as well. Tar spot is 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 you know. The high, you know, the, on everybody's mind right now. But northern corn leaf blight and gray leaf spot are are two diseases that, again, under these weather conditions, could be quite uh, pronounced. All of our surveys, you know, our surveys from last year, again, northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot, um, were high. You know, in 40, 50, 80 percent of our fields um, that we we scouted across the province with the uh, with agriculture agri food Canada out of Ottawa, uh, very common, um, and that. You know, that eastern, as Tracy said, eastern Ontario, um, from from Toronto over to 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 Quebec, have um, had very favorable uh, rainfall events, um, and that, and then I believe over last night, and that again had another dose of uh, uh, rain as well. So very favorable conditions there for these traditional diseases that uh, they see out there, potential for tar spot as well. And when it comes to being able to identify your diseases is critically important because, as we said, we have various different fungicides available to us, not only for, for tar spot, but all of the, the other diseases. This is part of our results um, that we do with the Corn Disease Working Group out of the U.S., looking at various different fungicides, efficacy for the different diseases, and, uh, and their ratings here. As you can see with tar spot, we've got four, four products now, acapella, um, Picoxy strobin just uh, got registration. It, it along with uh, Miravis Neo here, um, are, are what we would call suppressant uh, on their label as of right now. Uh, the two other products um, in terms of both Delero Complete and Veltima or Veltima Deluxe are very good in terms of tar spot control and have control on their label. So those are the four um, of those, you know, the, the acapella for my results and and our results that we see with our U.S. colleagues, you know, it 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 it's there. It can provide us with some control of tar spot, but not the same level of degree as we would see with the other three uh, products out there. As I mentioned, in terms of the timing, um, is is important. And one of uh, the questions becomes one app versus two apps. You know, one for for us for Ontario that. BTR1 application is a must because of our risk for dawn. Tracy mentioned uh, how insects and other um, factors can can contribute to to our ear rot issues and and dawn uh, production and that. So that is one that we can't miss if we're going to target or going to apply a fungicide. That VTR1 is is critically important. Um, our our trials have seen that uh, anything past you know R R3 R4 and and beyond is is not. I can, it doesn't provide us a level of control that we would see for for tar spot. Um, going too early um, at, is is also doesn't show a, a return on investment as well. This is from uh, my cooperator Mike Miller at at Rodney in in 2021. Just looking at some of his results um, where he has, is untreated one application, which was the VTR one application, and then two apps. Uh, followed uh, after that VTR one about two weeks after that, very similar to what we've done. Um, he didn't, you know, he got very good visual control. You can see that, but in terms of the yield, that three bushels didn't um, versus um, just the one app here. And for sure, the one app application uh, fungicide return on investment was there. That second app though didn't pay back, and and that's what we're generally seeing uh, as of right now in that. I mentioned that Spark uh, Tar Spotter app there. One of the questions we're getting right now is that if you plug it in, you look at it, you'll get a forecast. This was run today. This is out of the Halderman area. You'll see an 87, 88% risk for, for tar spot. That doesn't mean uh, go out there and spray. What it means is get out there and scout right now. That's one of the, the questions we have right now. And, and so, I've used tar spotter quite effectively to help us gauge where we need to be and where we need to be scouting and, uh, and that, and it, it can be um, uh, help in terms of targeting those fields that will need a, a follow-up uh, spray, but right now get out there, you utilize it for that scouting benefit as well. So those are 
a few of the things we're looking at right now. Um, the other one I want to touch on is this soybean cyst nematode. Um, we are seeing soybean cyst. Actually, my crew is out there right now. We're doing our first uh, ratings and digs for soybean cyst nematode. Um, the first uh, flush or first generation of cyst nematode are, are quite visible on, on the roots right now. And, and that the one thing, you know, we've talked about how the, the, the wet conditions have favored many of the other potential diseases and, and, and risks there. Um, but with soybean cyst nematode, it's delayed that first flush by about um, 10 days to two weeks, which is beneficial to us in that if we can get one less generation, uh, reproductive generation, then that can help us in terms of not having as many uh, uh, cyst nematode uh, levels increase by the end of this uh, end of the season as well. Um, but here, the very typical SCN symptoms out there, um, you'll start seeing these over the next two weeks or, or so as well, that stunted, um, very typical SCN type symptoms and all, you know, with weed escapes, et cetera, very typical of what we would see with, with SCN. Um, this is our map for uh, distribution of soybean cyst nematode. Dufferin has now been added to that. We're in the process of, of continuing to, to build on this map. Um, and basically you can see most areas where we've got uh, cyst or soybeans, we have soybean cyst nematode. Where I'd like um, some assistance uh, from everybody is that um, we're doing a nematode survey across the province. This is for field crops and, and horticultural crops. Um, so um, it's a free service, which is really nice. And we will, if you supply us with uh, samples, we will look at them not only for soybean cyst nematode, but for five to six other common nematodes across uh, the province. And the, and the good thing is you don't have to take a special sample for soybean cyst nematode if you don't want to. We could have it as a split sample, say for a fertility sample. Um, the other good news is you can have somebody else take it, your retailer or consultant uh, do it as well. And uh, if you um, would like to provide some samples, please reach out to, to myself or Katie Goldenhar. Um, my colleague or, or talk to your retailer or con crop consultant and that, and, and we can get those added to it. Again, it's helping us in terms of developing, um, uh, increasing our baseline and, and get a better handle of all the nematodes that could um, increase uh, impact both field crops and horticultural crops as well. When it comes to cyst nematode, that soil sampling is critically important because it helps us uh, determine your risk by knowing what your numbers are, um, a few things to keep in mind too, is that uh, you know our, our the big the big change here with um, with soybean cyst nematode is the adapted how nemat how the nematode is adapted to our main source of resistance that PI eight eight seven eight eight source of resistance and and for Ontario we're looking at uh, um, more and more cysts being on being found on on the eight eight seven. 8, 8 source of resistance across the province. We're not in the same boat as, say, Iowa, Illinois, and some of the Midwest states where 80, 90% of their fields had have high levels of this adaptive population. We're still at that, break e at that breaking point right now. Um, so please manage soybean cyst nematode with the tools that we have available. This integrated management is, is critically important. As we mentioned with the uh, the soybeans, um, you know, the root rots and that, having more crops in the rotation definitely can help. So grow non-host crops, corn, wheat, uh, you know, other small grains, et cetera. Uh, horticultural crops in there can help uh, reduce the, the selection pressure as well as reduce the numbers in the soil. We do have a number of new seed treatment nematicides out there as well. These can help us in terms of slowing SCN reproduction and uh, reducing some losses. But remember the nematode seed treatments or nematicide seed treatments out there are not silver bullets. They on their own will not be effective, but in an integrated management program, they can, I see some promise there as well. Cover crops is another one that we get a lot of questions about. There's some promise there in reducing SCN uh, population densities, but the published data there is, is, is sparse in some cases. It's much less, less dramatic and less consistent. 
um, from an SCN control standpoint right now. And so we got to be careful there. Actually, in some of my work, uh, we've actually seen other nematodes increase under these cover crop populations, particularly root lesion nematode. And that, so be careful on that side as well. The last one I want to quickly touch on is, is white mold. And we've seen, uh, you know, with this weather, these conditions, uh, apothecia, sclerotia will start to germinate. Again, this is uh, when it comes to, we've got a number of managed um, fungicides available. This is some data that we had from a couple of years ago from our inoculated trials that we do with uh, Owen Wally at Agriculture Ag Food Canada. This is just looking at disease incidence. And we can see that, you know, we have a, a range of products going from the least efficacious, so the higher uh, white mold levels down to lower levels um, down here. And you can see we've got our check at 50 here, um, and as well as um, in this case, we had a, an R2 application, and then we followed that up two weeks later with a second app in, in certain treatments as well. In terms of the, the yield, you can see that the majority of our uh, products, either in a single or double application, provided a significant yield over our susceptible check. All of them actually provided um, a yield advantage over our checks. Uh, the blues are those that were significantly different. But again, you can see we've got a number of good products, whether the Cotegras, the Allegros, you know, the Acapellas, Stratego Pros, uh, either single or uh, double applications can provide us with white mold control. Again, white mold, we're getting into that flowering period right now. These weather conditions could promote that. Again, knowing your knowing your field history, um, you know, risk of white mold. And then again, you know, that R1, R2 application there, if it uh, continues to be uh, quite favorable, if not, you can pull back with that one application to that R2, R3. Those problematic fields though, um, in many cases that uh, double application may be uh, uh, beneficial, um, especially if we end up with uh, very favorable epidemic type conditions for, for white mold as well. I know I've thrown quite a bit at you, right? And uh, so here's a few things to, to follow up on is the, the tar spotter uh, IPM pipe for corn. Um, the maps you can you can uh, follow through quite quickly there. The crop protection network as well. This is uh, uh, possible for, with support from the Grain Farmers of Ontario as well. So cropprotectionnetwork.org uh, has a number of different uh, disease as well as insect uh, is insect uh, entomology um, is is joining on, is on here too as well as agronomic issues as well. So cropprotectionnetwork.org, and that's it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Albert. Hey, just wondering about tar spot in the application. A lot of farmers are kind of wondering, hey, I see tar, tar spot, so I guess I got it. I can't really control it anymore. And then some, some farmers thinking, I don't see it, so I don't need to spray. Just kind of wonder your thoughts on fungicide and how long the product is actually active in the corn. And that kind of ties into your timing. I know your recommendations are at tassel or the R1, and that's really because of the length of time that that fungicide protects that plant, correct? Yeah. So we're looking at, depending on the product, uh, you're looking at two to three weeks, right? Um, um, in terms of residual there. And so that the timing part is critically important. And that's why we say to avoid those those early applications. Um, you know, our work last year, um, you know, we would go as we went as early as uh, five, six leaf stage, and we saw no, no impact there at the the V10, um, we did see some, but again, it's it's inconsistent. Where we were on our field, that is uh, four years of corn. It's had a history of tar spot. Last year, I you know I don't know if this is something I should be proud of, but it was the best tar spot uh, research plot in North America, right? And so, and we're back in there. And so, if if we're not getting that V10 to be consistently better than say that VTR1. Um, for most growers, which would have less pressure coming in later, that early application won't get you the benefit. And then last year, again, we did also a later one. So we were into, you know, that R4 and past. Uh, so milk and, and, and past uh, stages, um, we did not see a benefit there. 
for sure. So that, and that's where, don't forget though, you know, 2018 with Dawn and, and all of those, you know, that VTR one. And as Tracy mentioned, you know, we've got a lot of other factors there that we have to think about what's going on on that ear. And you're talking about wet. And if it's wet during pollination, I'm just thinking Dawn. So if you can yeah. time your, your two applications, your two applications at once right at pollination to protect yourself both ways. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so when you say two applications, sorry, fungicide, insecticide. No, sorry. I mean, protect for the two diseases. So for mm. fusarium infection into the silk channel for yep. Dawn, preventing that and preventing terror spot. Your best timing yeah. application is when the silk is, is exposed. And, and the same goes for, for Northern corn leaf blight as well, where you might be pushing a little earlier is if we had severe gray leaf spot early on, and that's, that's more Southern Ohio southern indiana and in that we don't we don't see those conditions normally here um we've got you know hybrids with good resistance you know <laughs> 10 years we might be talking totally different right yeah. Yeah. and if you're targeting two different diseases you got to make sure the products you're using are active on those two diseases so make sure your selection of product is correct as well absolutely and also regardless of whether it's an insecticide fungicide herbicide or something it's critically important to be out there scouting after you've made an application to do as well just to make sure that you're getting the results that you expect and if you're not getting the results you expect find out why and a good example is with um with all our tar spot uh, trials um, we had a, a disease or we had symptoms that looked like gray leaf spot coming out and the result there was uh, we thought oh maybe we made a mistake or something was going on or resistance, fungicide resistance or, or so like that. It turned out to be bacterial leaf streak, which is a new disease that started 2017 in, in Iowa, Nebraska, and that has started to, to move into, into our area as well. But a bacterial disease, you don't expect fungicides won't work there, right? So once you That's figured right. that out, no. those, those symptoms um, weren't, weren't unusual at that point. They were expected. Thank you so much, Albert and Tracy, for joining us today. You've just shared a wealth of information for Ontario's grain farmers to take and, and go out to the fields and start scouting and, and, and looking for, for things that are in the field. Uh, for those of you who are watching, we do have CEU credits available, so the QR code will pop up at the very end of this presentation. But overall, thank you, Tracy and Albert. Just uh, That was really, really insightful. So thanks. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. And thanks for the GFO support, of course. For sure. Thank you.